Then. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, Vicky, for the uh, the intro there. Um, like um, Vicky was saying, my name is Jonathan Belaski. I'm a environmental portrait photographer based out of Toronto, as well as Kitchener and all over the place. Um, yeah, started my career very early. I've uh, done tons of different types of photography. Everything from when I started out my career, I was a product photographer, a motorcycle uh, photographer, worked in that industry, and then graduated and has evolved over uh, time. But right now I'm best known for my environmental portraits. So I'm gonna share a presentation with you guys and we'll go through it. I'm gonna talk about uh, you know, what my passion is right now, how things have changed a little bit, um, what's going forward, talk a little bit about gear, um, what, you know, as a, uh, a student or somebody looking to get into this, what are some myths and what are some reasons why to choose some different things, and then uh, get into some business stuff. Um, I know it's not uh, right up there with uh, being creative aspect, but it's a huge, huge part uh, of the, uh, the field and uh, of any business right now. Um, that creativity also can be led into the business side of everything. So, so yeah, so let's uh, jump into the presentation. And uh, like uh, we said at the end, by all means, I'm an open book. So ask questions and then uh, we'll be able to take it from there. So, all right. So I'm just gonna share this presentation. All right, just gonna make sure the audio's on here. So what is an environmental portrait? Like I said, I'm an environmental portrait photographer. Um, so what does this really mean? And what does it mean going forward and creating images for a photographer? Well, an environmental portrait is a portrait that's executed uh, in the subject's usual environment such as their home, their workplace, and typically illuminates the subject's life and surroundings. So what that means for me is an environmental portrait is when I actually go into somebody's surroundings or environment and create a portrait of not only just them, but their workspace or their environment or their surroundings, because I want to tell a whole story within one picture. I want to know who they are, what they do, or what they are working on, and the kind of mood and feeling they have. So for example, like this shot here, this was done at uh, the Warloo uh, Railway and Amaro Railway just uh, around the corner from my studio. You know, these are volunteers, they're working, but they're also recreating a feeling, they're recreating what they're actually doing. So this is the way they work. You know, we're concentrating on the person, but the background and the subject matter is all connected and it tells the story. Again, you know, same, uh, same environment, you know, this is one of the head volunteers there and the head owners of the, uh, the railway, you know, getting the feeling of what they're doing is very important in the actual shot. This is a woodworker um, over in British Columbia here. Again, you know, you can kind of see the way he works, the feeling, the care, all of that type of stuff. And capturing the mood and the essence and the feel is very important within these shots. So, and, but when I'm in the environment, I also like to go and do detail shots as well. So that's where you can see on the left, you know, going in and doing tighter detail shots, you know, tighter things about uh, the way they're working. But it's all telling the story because we know, and like from my experience and my passion within the environmental portraits is everybody has a story and everybody has a really cool story. You just have to listen to what they're saying and listen to them because, you know, we can see lots of different things online. We can see different media and all this type of stuff. And like, you know, I have a, uh, a website called for the love of it as well, you know, but actually being in somebody's environment and immersing yourself with them in a good conversation and a good day is really important. So with that, you know, I don't just take mo uh, stills. We also take motion that goes alongside it. So I like to play this little video here uh, that goes with this one.
So a lot of that, uh, you know, creating those environmental portraits and creating the video aspect, a lot of people think, oh, you need a large crew and uh, a lot of people working behind the scenes. Well, for that woodworker um, shot, as well as the motion behind it, I prefer to use small crews. You know, it's something that's very typical now within our COVID area, and especially this year, where a lot of our uh, productions have really gone down in crew size. But it's something that I started doing many, many years ago. A small crew, myself, my assistant, and then the auxiliary crew if needed, um, is kind of the way I like to work. Because it's one of those things I find the more interaction and the more um, cohesiveness that you can actually get with your subject and you know the relationship that you build, the better shots that you can get. You know, something like this shot here, we had a large set design, but the really nice thing about this shot was it was done over in the Stratford Theater. And, you know, their warehouse has everything. She's a uh, actress over with the Stratford uh, company. And, you know, everything was right there. So it was just about putting the pieces together, working with her to actually capture the, uh, the scene that we needed. So again, working with the smaller intimate crews, we can create imagery that we want to do, but without a lot of the headache and a lot of the hassle. You know, for example, like this shot here, uh, this is with uh, Chef Jason over at Langdon Hall. Um, you know, it, it's when you have that personal relationship with the, the subject, you can ask things and create things that normally wouldn't happen. Like the morning of this shoot, we were uh, shooting some other stuff. And then I just asked Jason, I'm like, hey, Jason, what live what like what whole animals are we getting in today and he's like oh well we're getting in some salmon and we're getting in some pheasants and everything like that i'm like awesome let's go do a shot outside in the uh the garden way and you know we can use those live animals in the shot and then we can capture the essence and feel of what we're actually doing uh today now a lot of people ask me too it's like do you just shoot portraits is this it um Yes, I shoot portraits, I shoot advertising, I do a lot of work with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, I do pro athlete photography, covers of magazines for Sports Illustrated, but I always have different aspects of my business going because we never know when one thing is going to slow down and the next is going to pick up. So I do a lot of food photography as well. You know, I have a studio that's in the country um, that's off to the side where, you know, there's a lot of agricultural work. I've worked with agricultural companies and it's a huge passion of mine. So it was a natural progression for me to continue my love into my food photography. Now you'll notice that the style of my food photography is very similar to the style of my portraits because I have a consistent style my clients know it and they know what they're going to get right out of the gate you know we don't have to worry about oh okay well we need it this way or like playing around they just know what they're going to get right off the bat so whether it's like for a high-end restaurant or the dairy farmers of ontario we kind of have that feeling and that relationship again so but again like i said it's very important to have multiple avenues of revenue because you never know when one's going to go slower and one's going to go, you know, a little bit more. So for example, you can be an advertising photographer, but on a sub brand, you might decide to do weddings and portraits. Now you're not going to want to mix those two brands together because right now in the advertising world, if you're a wedding and portrait photographer, it's very hard to move the two together. But it's okay to have two different companies that do two different things or two different brands that do two different things. And, you know, it's a good way to continually keep income coming in, you know, especially during this COVID time. It's been one of those things where, you know, for myself, environmental portraits pretty much like working with people and in people's environments, it all stopped. Like it was a hard stop and we needed to continue on. No, I had staff that I had to pay. I had bills. I had my studio. I had everything. So how did I keep doing that? Well, all I did was pivot over to another one of my brands and then concentrate on that for the next little bit. And that's what we've been concentrating on this year.
So to continue with this multiple brand strategy, you definitely have to almost separate yourselves, but then your good clients or your long-term clients will know that you do multiple different things. So then they're, they're more worried about, or like they're more apt to being like, hey, John, can you go do this video for us? And then can you go shoot this product? And then that keeps the ball rolling very well. So this is some other food from uh, Langdon Hall here. And again, you know, different things, long-term clients. Like I've worked with Langdon Hall for many, many years. So they know that I do food as well as the portraits, as well as the lifestyle work. You know, other clients that I've had, it's all long-term clientele. Because it is one of those things when you develop the relationship with them, it's building on that relationship and you can keep them for longer. So working with the uh, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment, not only do I do the uh, athlete photography, like the Leafs and the Raptors, TFC, all of their player portraits for their advertising as well as their Instagram and all that type of stuff. I also handle a lot of their food and beverage clientele, like for this, which is Drake Shear Club. So we do all of the food photography and all of the content creation for that, um, but it all ties in. And they all expect the same quality. So whether I'm working on set with athletes or on food, again, same care, same content or quality of content is always taken into play. So one thing, especially as a, uh, a student or somebody getting into uh, photography or video, I get asked all the time is like, hey, John, what camera should I get? What should I do? You know, I see you going with all these, like you can see in behind me here, um, scrims, lights, cameras, monitors, and we see all the big sets, like what Annie Leibovitz or Joel Grimes or Zach Arias does, all of these big, big sets. Um, but why do we really need all that? And a lot of the times that I tell them, I'm like, no, you don't. I spent a lot of my career working with smaller cameras. Like I said, I use small crews. So then I've developed small camera kits that we can go. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna show you a, uh, a set that we did and we were flying into the, the ranch. It's an agricultural set, but I took one camera with one lens. My cinematographer took one camera with one lens and we had our small, small drone with us. So literally one ca two cameras, two lenses, one little flash, and that was it. And we can create beautiful imagery. It's just learning how to use the camera to maximize its potential. So for example, like this shot here of the rancher, there was a single light off to the left-hand side. We shot at the appropriate time of day, which was first thing in the morning. We knew the sun was going to be low, the cattle was going to be in the right uh, area. And then we just worked with it. You know, again, single camera. It, this one itself wasn't even a DSLR or a uh, mirrorless. It was actually just a fixed lens, single camera called the Fuji X100. Um, so I know I can push my cameras to the limit with creating beautiful stuff. So even nowadays, like what you can create with the iPhone, like the brand new iPhone that just came out, you know, we've done full productions with just iPhones or with just little drones or little cameras, because, you know, again, it's less about the gear itself and it's more about the creativity that you're going to bring to it and knowing how to push your cameras to the limits. So again, same situation, single light situation, gathering everything we need, shot at the right time of day, you know, and finding the really cool location. So it's not necessarily about your gear. Could I have created this image with a $100,000 camera, like a phase one system? For sure, I could have. Did I create it with a $100,000 system? No, I created it with a $1,300 camera. And so they've also ran these as billboards, as um, full trade show booths. So again, knowing your cameras and knowing your limitations and knowing what you can do is 
all about practice. So I've been shooting since I was very young. Um, you know, like Vicky said, like I opened my first major studio when I was 19. I started shooting when I was in high school. Um, I was lucky because I found a good mentor, you know, started my first studio when I was in high school, went to college and then continued on. And I'll tell a little bit more about my uh, business background a little bit later. But again, small cameras, small kids. So here's the video that goes along with that, uh, that setting. So pre-planning for all of the, the videos and the stills is very important. Finding your niche that you want to do, again, is uh, very important. Um, but all these things intertwine to each other. You know, like I said, I started out as a product photographer. I started out thinking that's what I would do for the rest of my life. Now, it's not where I ended up. I ended up back into, you know, my environmental portraits. Now, how did that all become? Well, I was working heavily in products and heavily in studio work for a long time, honing my lighting and honing my skills there. Then, you know, I was working a lot in the corporate world and doing a lot of heavy duty composites and everything like that. So back in 2012, I decided, you know, I'm going to stop for a minute and get away from the computer and get away from the, the heavy duty composites and start thinking about how we're going to roll into going a little bit more of a traditional photography route. So I challenged myself. I was like, I'm going to do a personal project where I produce 52 portraits, one a week for a whole year. And that's what really started my wheels turning with my environmental portraits. And I continued on that way and continued on that subject for a long time um, because I fell in love with it. So I reinvented myself in 2012 with the environmental portraits. Now, I still had my corporate clients, which we were still doing corporate work, but they started seeing the fresh stuff that was coming out of my personal project. So having that personal project really gained the aspects of moving forward and then continued on into my corporate work. And then again, it was one of those things where I was doing a lot of um, sports photography with environmental portraits and other uh, work with uh, environmental portraits for magazines and all this type of stuff. And then I really, about two and a half years ago, went back to something that I've been doing all along, which is my food photography and my love, and decided to reinvent myself again and focus on agricultural sector as well as the culinary. So the whole farm to fork movement, everything like that. And, you know, really redevelop my skill set that way and focus my marketing on there. But at the same time, keeping all my clientele, like from my educational stuff, my sports stuff, and the, uh, the food and uh, agricultural stuff all going at the same time. So this brings me to the whole thing about why understanding business and how to run a business is very integral to a creative. There's a lot of different things. You need to understand your clients. You know, understanding your clients is like the best thing you can do and figuring out what they like and how they like to interact with you is very important. For example, I have some clients that prefer to not worry about the monetary aspect, the, the costing, the production aspect of it, and more focus on being a friend within the industry as well as during set and after set. So for example, a perfect example of this is a client that I've had for over 20 years. They're in the educational industry. We're good friends. We talk about our kids. We talk about, you know, we both started out 
uh, fairly young in our careers, worked together, you know, at that uh, educational institute. And then we continually have grown together. So we're in the same stages of life. You know, we've had kids together, et cetera, that type of thing. And we're at the point now where it's like his family and my family, we can chat. You know, and we don't really have to talk about the the monetary aspect because he knows I'm going to be fair with him. So understanding the client that way. Now, another way, not just on the friendship side or what their needs are, um, understanding your client is diving into what they actually need is important. So like I said, and like Vicky said, I started shooting very early. Like I started when I was in high school. Went from high school, I had an amazing uh, mentor who taught me a lot and, you know, was almost to the point where it's like, hey, do you want to just work or do you want to go to college? At that time, my girlfriend was like, no, you need to go to college. So I went to college. And then during first semester, they're like, are you sure you want to go to college? And I'm like, okay, well, I started, I need to finish it. And it was a really great thing because I've had long-term clients from college. Um, but I did the thing in high school, went to college. Afterwards, everybody was like, you know, why don't you get a real job? You know, why are you gonna be a creative? Why are you gonna be a photographer? My parents were in the creative industry. So for them, it was one of those things. It's like, we've seen the way it is, we understand it. So let's see if you can get something else. So that's when I went and be, started working for a multinational manufacturer as a creative director and brand manager and worked my way up there. So that was an amazing experience for me because I could see how things ran in a big corporation in a big multinational and worked my way up in that levels all the way up to the top. I was setting up showrooms all over the United States working on million dollar plus accounts as a 19 year old and 19, 20 year old. And it was, it was great. But there was something longing a little bit more for me. I still wanted to do my own thing. So I was an entrepreneur. But I will never say that that time at that uh, company was a waste. It was a great learning experience because it allowed me to understand my clients a little bit more. Because now I can predict what they need and I can preempt it by saying, oh, yeah, well, we can set it up this way or we can do something a little bit different in the, the other side. So it's a, a huge benefit for you. So if you can get as much broad experience view in the market that you want to go into, it's really important. And talk to every single person that you possibly can. Knowing the sales cycle for your clients, again, is a huge benefit. Because if you know how they are going to sell their products, you can know how better to ask them like we have one client for example where we actually remind them being like hey you know this is coming up so we should be doing xyz to make sure that you're ready and they're like oh yeah we didn't even think about that right now so yeah let's book that in and then we continue on so again knowing their continual sales cycle has helped generate so much more for my companies than you know just saying hey you know, give me a call when you have some work that we need to be done. You know, the communication and customer service is a huge thing that's so understated, and especially nowadays. Um, communication with your clients and communication with anybody is very important because it is a never ending thing where it's like, you need to talk to them about the job, but beyond the job, you need to talk to them about the billing. And then you need to talk to them about deposits and how everything works that way. So knowing how to talk to them and when it's appropriate to bring up certain things versus others is very important. Now, customer service side, if something does go wrong on set, or let's say, you know, you forget to do something or you miss a deadline or anything like that, customer service goes a long way. You can either continually churn your clients and just do one-off jobs every once in a while, or you can build that long-term relationship with them. 
there's jobs that I haven't made any money on because, you know, they've said, hey, we only have this little budget. But I know in the turn, if we help them out here, they're going to be more receptive to do the other jobs in the end. So that whole customer service aspect is very key. You know, the whole adage, the customer is always right, isn't the right way to think of it in especially the 2020, 2021, but the customer is the most important thing in your wheelhouse right now, because they're the ones that you need to keep happy, but you also need to work with educating. So that whole customer service aspect is really, really key. Now, the last thing is understanding accounting. I can't tell you how important this has been, especially in uh, 2020 for myself. You know, making sure that my business itself has been fully functional. You know, I'm not buying too much gear. I don't have too much overhead. Understanding my rates and understanding how things work. You know, it's been a very important cycle because it's like, you can very easily all of a sudden fall off the radar and be like, ah, we don't have any money left in the account. We have to shut down or we have to go bankrupt. The whole starving artist thing I have a hard problem with is because if you build your company, like you're building your portfolio for your creativity, you're going to be in a good foundation. So knowing your base steps that you need to do for your accounting, knowing and getting a really good mentor who's going to train you both in the creative as well as in the business, getting involved in your community, you know, talking with a bunch of people who are successful because like, you know, the, the sum of like the five people that you work with most is typically going to be where you're going to gravitate to. The other thing is, is understanding what you need to do and how long you can have for a runway. So for creative, being a self-employed entrepreneur, you're probably going to want to have about, you know, that six to 12 months worth of expenses in the bank at all time to weather out the storm. I have some friends that are photographers that only do like four to five jobs a year. And if they don't get one of those four to five jobs, they're like, uh, we got to weather it a little bit more. Now I'm a different, I'm a little bit different than them because I have multiple different revenue streams. So from multiple different companies, because I've built my business that way. You know, I have my photography company, I have an equipment rental company, I have a production company and I have a printing company. And then that all works up vertically that way. And then, you know, beyond that real estate, et cetera, et cetera. But it's building multiple revenue streams that can sustain you through pretty much anything and everything. And I started this when I was in high school because starting all of that is really important. So again, to recap, it's like, you know, the business acumen, the business side of it is just as important as the creative side of it. I have good friends of mine who run a video production company. One partner's a video creative and a motion creative. The other partner is a um, economics major and a BCom. So working together is a perfect marriage because they have both the business side and the creative side, and they can move forward after that. So it's really important overall, creativity, knowing what you want is very, very important. Knowing where you want to be in five, 10 years, again, is very important. But, you know, everything is all geared around the actual creative business of it. So thank you very much for uh, listening to the, the presentation today. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, bring myself back here, and then we're gonna definitely go into some uh, Q&A and uh, we'll go from there. So let me just get out of this. Hi, Vicki. Um, thank you so much. We're just gonna, I don't have any questions at the moment. So I think this is a shy audience here. Um, I know I have one. Just any tips on getting paid? So definitely. Um, 
always take a deposit up front. Like that's the number one um, that we work with all the time is finding out, you know, where you are and you take the deposit to cover all your costs of your production. And then after that, going forward, is you set out the rules right out of the gate. So make sure you have your contracts all signed. Make sure you have everything set. So it's like they know whether it's 30, 60, 80, 90 days. And uh, it, it creates a, uh, an unspoken rule. So they, they know it's in there. It's in black and white. Um, now, with it, like I have clients that we're definitely lenient and we understand that there's the sales cycle for them. So we know that we're not necessarily going to get paid for that 30 days. It's going to be the 60 to 90 to 240 days sometimes. But as long as you've planned for that and you've covered your expenses up front and you know you might have to pay a little bit out of your pocket to keep things going, it'll come back to you tenfold because they'll just be like, okay, well, you're a long-term client then, so. And I think that's the other important thing about having long-term clients because you know that and you can help them out and go both ways. Um, Second question, what is the one piece of equipment you you can recommend to someone starting out that they purchase? So, well, one, you, for a photographer, you definitely need your, your camera, right? So my suggestion is finding a camera that you actually love, um, that you like. You know, for me, if I was my desert island type kit, like if I was stuck in a forest in northern Canada and I couldn't get any equipment for a very long time, um, I would just take my little Fuji X100 kit and that's it. So not a big camera, not a 100 megapixel medium format camera, something small, weather resistant, little camera. Um, The other thing that, you know, I couldn't live without is my crew, my production people. Like, you know, it's, it's so underestimated. You know, everybody thinks, oh, you know, again, like we need equipment, equipment, equipment. A lot of the times it's more important about the people that you surround yourself with. So you can call on their needs and their, their abilities. So it's like, you know, if I didn't have um, good relations with my producer, things would just fall apart. Like it's, you know, the same with our stylist and our food stylist. So it's just, uh, again, like the people are very important. Um, but as a photographer or as a, uh, a creative, not worrying about continually upgrading your equipment is important, but finding a camera that you really like is very key because if you dread picking it up or if you don't actually like the way it functions or you find it hard to work with, you're, you're gonna start worrying more about the camera itself or then the creativity. So it's finding that one piece of equipment that really works for you. Good point. I know I've heard other people just talk about fit, it, the right fit of camera. So in that, yeah. that's true. You don't have to spend a lot of money on it. It's just finding that right one. Um, any tips for going on or starting an entrepreneurship? Yeah, definitely talk to as many people as you can. Um, Entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. You know, I've had um, meetings and photo sessions with entrepreneurs that, you know, they've sold their companies for hundreds of millions of dollars, but they're also on their third, fourth marriage and their kids have stopped paying attention to them or listening to them because it's like they've gone bankrupt multiple times. Um, likewise, there's the entrepreneurs that want to build a lifestyle business and, you know, that's where it's like, they've kind of generated what their thoughts are and what they actually want out of their business. So my biggest advice is figure out truly what you are interested in and, you know, be perfectly honest with yourself. Like, do you want to have a hundred employees? Um, multiple different revenue streams, multiple different things and working 90 hours a week? Or do you want to have a lifestyle business where you can work one day a week, two days a week, keep things going and have fun at it? Um, But both have their stresses. You know, lifestyle business, if all of a sudden stuff crumbles down and you have no more revenue, 
you're going to stress out. So same with the larger business. If you get big enough, you can sell and then be free for the rest of your life. So talk to a ton of different entrepreneurs. Like that is the best advice that I can give is talk to people that have done both sides. Find your fit, like find out truly what you want and what your end goal is five to 10 years from now. Because if you're not true about that, like if, like, for example, me, if I said, yeah, I want to be running a a large multinational corporation with hundreds of employees, it doesn't really fit with my values or my persona because it's like, I want to spend time with my kids. I want to take longer vacations. I want to, you know, generate that type of thing uh, for my lifestyle. Now, I love what I do. Like, it's a pure passion. Like, the photography, the video, the stuff we create is a a huge passion for me. Um, But I need to be realistic about my expectations. You know, are are we going to become a billionaire? Well, probably not. So, but I'm realistic about that. So, I'm not always going for the next best thing. And uh, understanding your cadence of, you know, your needs and wants and everything is very, very important. Um, I'm also sure that um, school um, teachers are a great resource um, to help you out because many of them have worked in the industry. Plus there's associations out there to get together with professional photographers, if that's the area you want. Um, what do you do if when a shoot doesn't turn out the way you or your client expected? <laughs> when it all goes downhill very quickly, right? So um, there's, there's very different, there, there is different things that you can do. Um, reshoots are a possibility. Like we've had to reshoot stuff. It, it has been um, times where it's like we've shot stuff. We love it, but the client, the end client doesn't really like it. So at that point, what do you do? Well, you've made sure that you've had all your sign offs, hopefully, and then you work out a deal to make that happen. Now, if you totally mess up, well, that's all on you then. Like I've had it where, um, not myself, but our whole production, there was large power outages during the shoot. So we basically had to keep things going a little bit longer. Well, is that our fault or is it the facility's fault or anything? So what we did is we just did everything possible to make it right in the end. And in the end, everybody was happy. So do everything you possibly can to make it right. Um, But be within reason. Like, you know, you guys as creatives, if your client is starting to kind of overstep their bounds and ask for more and more and more and more continually, you know, you have to rely on your contracts that you have set up prior to the actual shoot or the motion. Um, A perfect example is uh, like one of my friends down in the United States, he started out as a, a music photographer and, you know, when he was getting into it, he would always just shoot, you know, music stuff for free. And then like, you know, their, uh, the artist would be like, oh, well, we don't really like it. So we're not going to pay for it. But then like, he would see it being used later on. And he would always have to go back to being like, guys, you said you didn't like it. So we gave you a deal on it, but then you're using it and you're promoting it like years after so it's like and then when he started getting bigger and bigger he more had to start relying on what the agreements were uh prior um but again always try to make your client happy like i can't underestimate how important that is um you know if it does mean like for example for me like if it does mean that i'm not going to make any money on the job I, you know, I'm going to do everything in my power to make my client happy and uh, get what they ultimately want. Um, Because again, you know, you never know where you're going to run into somebody else again. And especially in this creative industry, you know, it is one of those things that, you know, you'll see and work with somebody at a company one year and then three, four years down the road, you'll see them at another company. And, uh, you know, and then you never know where that is. So burning bridges is, is definitely a hard thing in this industry. And Vicki, I'm sure you agree with that too. So 
completely agree. I mean, it is. I mean, it's such a big industry, but it's very small. Um, and everything is so entwined um, together. So yeah, I definitely agree with that. And the whole thing about business, being a good business person is understanding the contracts and making sure, you know, your client is aware of those client of yeah, those agreements as well. For sure. I think that is it. I don't see any other questions. Um, thank you again, Jonathan. It was a great session. Um, thank you for your time. I hope that everyone here also agrees with me that it was very beneficial. Don't forget as you start your school application or just starting to explore your talents um, and finding out where they fit in the industry, be sure to visit creativefutures.ca. We have a session scheduled for 11 a.m. today and it's actually Jonathan Stylist um, to kind of talk behind the scenes and the shift from photography to becoming a stylist. Um, you can still register at creativefutures.ca, just click on speaker series and find Michaela um, in the menu. Thank you, Jonathan. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram. I'm at John Belaski, and uh, I'll definitely answer anybody's questions there and uh, just send me a direct, direct message. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Perfect. Thanks, guys.